So for this session, we're going to do a little mixture of um, some content and some meditation. Um, we're going to start with the Buddhist practice of setting our motivation. And so in order to do that, we're going to use a refuge in bodhicitta prayer. And uh, we'll say it in Tibetan as a kind of token of auspiciousness in recognition of the lineage that has held Buddhism so beautifully that we're now responding to today. And uh, it's basically saying, I've got backup. <laughs> Yeah, I've got backup and I've got inner connection to altruism and wanting to be a benefit to all sentient beings. So you're just kind of tuning in and then connecting with um, the outer as well. So we'll just do that prayer, but don't feel like you need to say it. Sangay <laughs> Roll up and cheer, Sangay Drupa Show. Sangay Churum Sogi Chunamla. Janchu Badu Dani Kapsuchi. Dagi Chun Yen Gipe Sonamki. Roll up and cheer, Sangay Drupa Show. And just take a minute and let a positive motivation form into your own words to yourself something more than yourself, more than today, a positive ripple effect. So we'll go ahead and get into it. Um, we left off yesterday talking about the concept of great compassion and how it's different to regular compassion. And when we're talking about compassion in general, I think it's useful to clarify the Buddhist definition of compassion because it's not sympathy, it's not pity, it's not empathy. There's something very specific that we're talking about in Buddhism when we talk about compassion. So does anyone remember kind of the rough definition of compassion, just regular compassion that we were talking about yesterday? It doesn't have to be perfectly articulated. You stressed that it was more than empathy, it was more seeing the potential um, of Buddhahood in everyone. For me, I have a kind of an outline picture of the world mm -hmm. in my on my altar. So um, I'm I'm thinking of the whole world. So in my mind, that's great compassion, but you know, that everybody has this potential yep. of Buddhahood and of, um, of a way to end their suffering. Um, but you had talked about, it's not just empathy for a person, but going beyond that. So yeah. I'm not sure how to phrase that the way you did so well. <laughs> well, you know, I can't take any credit, you know, because <laughs> it's the Buddhism really is, is the good, um, the good talking comes from the Buddhism, the awkward talking right. comes from the Yintin. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, to kind of like the nutshell is just compassion is wishing all sentient beings to be free from suffering, which means you understand the potential for freedom simultaneously with the actuality of suffering. Right. And so if you're holding only potentiality, you become a plastic, positive thinking person who is really hard to live with and obnoxious. And they're like, it's all good. It's all good. And you're like, is it? Is it all good? You know, and that's not cool. Right. We don't want that. But if you're saying, oh, look at the suffering, look at the suffering. It's like, I know, I know. Like, don't remind me. You know, I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to listen to my friend's divorce. Uh, and you can get overwhelmed. So compassion is holding the two simultaneously. And that's why there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. There is empathic distress. But when psychologists or pop psychologists say compassion fatigue, that's very frustrating for Buddhists because in Buddhism, if you're operating with the simultaneous vision that you're seeing potential and seeing suffering, seeing suffering doesn't wear you out. When you're getting worn out, it's because you've shifted to seeing only the suffering. 
and making it too permanent and too finite and too identified with feeling like it's only your job to fix everything in front of you right now. And if you and you've missed the fact that all sentient beings have the potential for complete enlightenment for perfect health absolute perfect health, inner and outer health, and that we can be a condition for that, but it's not our job to like yoink them into happiness and health, you know, like kicking and screaming, like you shall be healthy and I shall now help you. You know, it's like we can be a positive condition and that is a joyful work to be a part of, but lots of people are a part of that work. So whenever you're feeling that fatigue that comes with seeing suffering, you just want to take a step back and ask, am I over-invested in fixing the tiny everyday details of a situation that maybe don't even need to be fixed? And I somehow feel like it's all my job and I'm putting all sorts of very fiddly micromanaging responsibility on myself. Or am I just seeing how very hard it is for sentient beings and how epic and tragic and grief stricken they are, and it's just wilting me because I don't even know where to start. You know, just kind of taking a step back and asking where is the pressure, the inner pressure coming from? Because, you know, what can happen is if we're used to bearing witness to suffering a lot and we haven't developed compassion, what happens over time is we become hardened or we become depressed, right? Like, have you ever been to the doctor and they just don't even see your humanity because they've seen so much suffering in their lifetime. They've just kind of had to block off their heart and they don't even see the person in front of you, you know, in front of them with their struggles and they're just cut off. And it's a completely understandable coping strategy, but we don't want that to happen to us, right? We don't wanna harden in response to suffering and we don't want to collapse in response to suffering. So compassion is bearing witness to potential, bearing witness to suffering. Great compassion is then taking it a step further and saying, it's my responsibility to work on myself. And that is the greatest benefit I can bring to sentient beings today, because that's going to really help bring out the best in them. So, so what Denise was saying is really beautiful in terms of like great compassion being kind of equated to equanimity in a way, it sounds like, like kind of like all pervasive compassion, not leaving anybody out, going, you know, going across all borders and boundaries and just that like really holistic compassion. And I think that that's a really big component. And I think that's really important, the equanimity. But, you know, like if we're talking technically, what's the procedure? we're really taking it a step from seeing potential and seeing suffering into how can I bring out the potential and be a condition to diminish the suffering. So there's this element of personal responsibility, which is not being a healthy helper fix it person. It's a deep commitment, a deep responsibility to stay grounded and connected to your own path so that in the moment, your creativity is accessible to be of benefit to others, whether it's with silence or it's with words, whether it's with actions or stillness, you're able to see that because you've touched your own inner stillness, right? And you've really connected to your own refuge. So there's not that like panic of what should I do? What should I do? You have the calm that can make the best choice given your amount of development so far. I want her the Dalai Lama say that um, we as Western people and as lay people don't really understand the meaning of compassion. He um, he noted that uh, concern is more important than um, taking on the full weight of, um, now I'm not saying it in his words exactly, but um, taking on the full burden, the heavy burden of, um, of another person. When you were talking about higher um, compassion, it struck something inside of me because that's my path has been in 
looking at my own shortcomings. Yeah. Look at looking at where I'm at. Um, so that if I was to, and I am attracted to um, Lo Jong and Tong Wen, um, I need to be able to identify. In other words, put myself in another person's shoes. Yeah. And, re and really understand. Yeah. Or not what they're going through. Absolutely. And, you know, and some of the words that you use, like heavy burden, you know, this is not what the feeling of compassion should have for us, but it's kind of how we've been trained. Like if I'm showing concern and I'm showing empathy, I somehow need to be distressed to companion your distress. Like I'm being, you know, sympathetic or, you know, oh, that's terrible. I'm going to also cry, you know, as if that's somehow helping. And I think it helps to really step back and ask, when has compassion been effective for my suffering? Like who's been the friend or how was the friend in those moments where their compassion was effective in bringing some kind of relief? And I'm guessing that, you know, if you're crying and falling apart and having an, you know, existential, right? If your friend is like, oh my God, you're so right. And they like start falling to pieces as well. That's not supportive, right? <laughs> you're like, I'm glad you understand, but are you okay? <laughs> you, know, right? um, you know, and so it's just kind of, it, it's asking yourself what has been useful. And I think that we're all aware, but maybe haven't articulated that compassionate presence that is like holding the space for you to just be a mess, but you're a mess while at the same time, the person watching your mess still respects you, right? Like it's a totally different experience than someone who is like, oh, they're there but they're like pitying you and they're going, how did you get yourself into that? You poor bugger, like, oh boy, you know, like that's, doesn't feel supportive. <clears throat> but if someone's like, I am seeing all your suffering, I am loving you to bits and I know this is not the whole spectrum of you and this is not your forever way of being, you know, they don't have to say any of those things, but you can kind of feel when someone respects you while at the same time sees you falling apart a bit. So I think a huge component of compassionate presence is that respect, which for a Buddhist is built on respect for their Buddha nature, you know, respect for their right to be free from suffering and to have happiness and all of those kinds of things. But just kind of to make it personal and ask like, when you've been going through it, when it's been really rough for you, what's the friendships that have been effective or what's the support that's been effective? Yeah. And every once in a while, it's someone saying the right thing at the right time, but as often as not, it's silence and just being there, right? Which if you're the supportive friend, that is the hardest thing to just like keep your mouth shut and not like flood them with your advice of your whole lifetime and try this, try this, try this, try this, you know, like <laughs> have a snack, have a cup of tea, let's go for a walk, let's do some exercise. I was, have you considered therapy? You know, like you're just like, you know, machine gunning them with healthy helper things when really yeah. they just need you to sit next to them and be like, yeah, samsara, right? Crap. Yeah. I can I can feel you. I can be with you on that level. When somebody goes ahead and starts interjecting, or um, my inner critic, as it were, will start interjecting and want to help. Oh, yeah. I want you. It's like almost being like a regular, you know, annoying um, Jewish mother who. You've got to do it, honey. Why not? You know, <laughs> it just doesn't. It doesn't work like that, you know. And for me, if I'm going to go ahead, I tried that too in yeah. terms of um, wanting to take on the entire world sorrow. I pretty much freaked <clears throat> out myself. I couldn't handle that, and and I doubt that anybody can. When it when we go ahead and put that burden on ourselves. Well, and this is the whole point is that it's not a burden when you're approaching it the right way. Right? Yeah. And it's you have to play with it because we've been conditioned incorrectly. Yeah. 
And so just very gently, how do you companion your own suffering? You know, like start with you, you be your own friend for a minute. And just how do you sit with your own suffering and be like, oh, mate, that's rough. You know, you can tell I just came from Australia, but <laughs> mate, that's rough. <laughs> Dude, that's rough. <laughs> just like, you know, but like, let yourself feel like, ouch, that is not what I wanted to happen or that is not how I want to be feeling. And like, let yourself feel your feelings while at the same time holding your own potential. You know, you know that you've moved through things in the past, you'll move through things in the future. It can sound a little bit simplistic and trite, but when you've touched the, the real resonance with it, it's something epically profound and it's kind of hard to articulate the depth of it. But probably we've all had moments of being able to pull ourselves out of a really tricky spot, yeah, <clears throat> or being there when someone else is able to do so. So great compassion, there's steps, you know, you can't just kind of say, oh, now I will have great compassion because I like the idea of it. You know, liking the idea of it should bring aspiration and inspiration. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Gompa person. Um, <laughs> I just have a question with developing compassion. How do you arrive at developing compassion for somebody who is deeply? Yeah, yeah. Like the last thing we instinctively want to do is yeah hurt me but i want to bless you with my compassion <laughs> <laughs> yes it's a classic tale did you guys hear that yeah some half oh, she was asking about um how do you develop compassion for someone who is hurting you yeah a classic tale, right? Um, and especially if we're someone who's on some sort of spiritual path and we know that forgiveness is a good idea, you know, <laughs> and like compassion is really important and we're like, okay, do it, do it. And I will, I will. And they're like, I'm not feeling it. You know, <laughs> the thing with harm givers is that we sometimes forget that you do not have to say their behavior was okay in order to have compassion for them. So sometimes our compassion is blocked because it feels like tied up with the compassion is you had permission to hurt me and that was okay. And, you know, we don't want to agree with that because it's not true, right? But compassion is just saying, I see your suffering. And actually, if you had not been suffering with afflictions and ignorance, you would not have been so horrible. I wish you freedom from suffering for your sake. Yes, but also for mine, because if you had not been suffering, you would not have hurt me and you wouldn't hurt all these other people that you hurt. So it's, it's a genuine logic based kind of thing of they're horrible because they're hurting. And you know that it's psych 101, right? It's not even Buddhism, right? Like everybody knows hurt people, hurt people, you know, but that's sometimes not enough for you to feel it, like to feel the genuine, okay, yep, may you be free of your suffering. So, so to really sit with what would make you do the horrible things that they did. And that's so hard because you often don't relate to harm givers because you would never do that, right? Like say it's something really epically bad that you would never do. So you wanna kind of like move yourself down the spectrum to minor versions of the same thing until you can find yourself there, right? And if you have enough self-awareness, you'll be able to find yourself somewhere in the spectrum of that bad behavior, even if it's a much milder form. Yeah, think about the opposite of compassion. When you say, I just don't understand why they dot, dot, dot. When you do understand why they dot, 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 there's affinity, yeah, and there's pathways of empathy, which very much helps you grow into compassion. But who wants to be empathic to a serial killer or a rapist or a child molester? No one wants to be empathic to that. And yet all of those terrible, and I'm going to the worst, it's like you're probably just talking about a hard boss or something, right? <laughs> but you know, like the guy that cut you off in traffic. But um, you know, like if you're thinking about those really heinous things that you would never do, there's no possible way you would do it in this life still there's a way for you to see that there is a way in which you have felt entitled to the bodies of others maybe it was only your pet <laughs> right maybe your pet was sleeping quietly on a cushion happy and content and you were like we shall have a cuddle immediately <laughs> and you took the whole cat from their cozy nap and were like mm, my baby and the cat was like oh for god's sake <laughs> right? 
<laughs> right? And it's like a relatively benign thing to have done and the cat probably doesn't really mind. But it's in the spectrum of you decided that your pleasure was more important than their bodily autonomy, right? And that your position of power entitled you to take them, right? So it's a very benign version and the cat probably is not traumatized. I'm not, no, don't everyone like go apologize to your cat now. You're like, I'm so sorry, Fluffy, you know, like they're probably fine, but it's something we're sitting with of, it's not like we don't have that behavior. Yeah, we do, we all have everything. It's just a matter of degree. Yeah, and so if you can kind of be with, what makes me ignorant to the suffering I create when I'm that, my, my tiny version of that, you know, it can start to kind of like settle you with the harm giver and be like, okay, if I'd lived your kind of life and I'd experienced your kind of background and had your kind of context, those same choices would seem more permissible. You know, the only reason that those choices don't seem permissible to me in my life is that I wasn't brought up in such a way that encouraged that. I didn't have those behaviors nourished in a way that escalated them into the heinous version and thank all that is holy that I didn't because I don't wanna hurt people that way. But if they're hurting people that way, it's not coming out of nowhere. And they're not a unique brand of human. There's not like evil people and not evil people just kind of primordially. Everything is conditioned, you know? So, so if somehow there can be some pathways of affinity and relating that can help. And then of course, the, the easiest is just to be like, what's the suffering that drove the behavior, you know? <clears throat> and so use a very simple example, so simple that it's absurd. Think if someone sneezes on you, it's gross. You're not saying, oh, that was nice, thank you. But you're not mad at them. You think they're sick. So it's, it's a similar thing, like they did a gross thing. You don't want the gross thing on you, but they did it because they're unwell, you know? And so what do you need to do to protect yourself from what they're spewing? You take those measures, but you're not gonna like punish them for being unwell because how is that gonna make them healthier? You know, these kind of thoughts to play with, you know, these kind of thoughts to play with. So, so never think that developing compassion is permitting bad behavior. It's about not letting the bad behavior close your heart or disturb your peace, yeah. It's, it's in a way, it's like, don't give them the power to do that, yeah. So just very gently. So I thought to talk about a few of these um, strategies to really develop um, great compassion all the way into bodhicitta. And um, we were talking a couple of days ago about how bodhicitta is like the main motivation in Mahayana Buddhism. So it's this mind with two aspirations to become enlightened, to benefit sentient beings. Right, so this is bodhicitta, and this is the motivation that we're always working on in um, Tibetan Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. And the goal is complete enlightenment, complete Buddhahood, so that you can benefit all sentient beings. Before Buddhahood, your benefit is somewhat limited, right? So to get yourself kind of into the framework that's going to want to have bodhicitta, there's two main methods that are discussed in Tibetan Buddhism. One is called the fold cause and effect. <clears throat> um, sometimes you'll hear it called the six causes and one effect instruction. And one is called equalizing and exchanging. So these are two strategies for getting yourself to genuinely want to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And they're analytical processes, right? So it's not like you have to just naturally want this. And like, if I say it enough, it'll be true. It's logic, you're using logic to get yourself into it. You're using experience to get yourself into it. And then you're repeating it until a thought becomes a behavior. So this first one is basically the gratitude strategy. The other one is more the logic strategy. So the gratitude strategy is probably the most confronting for Westerners because it starts with needing to see all sentient beings as having been your mother. 
and you may not like your mother. <laughs> so then how is that going to make you feel friendly to all sentient yeah. beings, right? Yeah, like, I used to say, if I see all sentient beings as having been my mother, then my relationship with all sentient beings will be complex, <laughs> right? So I don't know if that's a good idea. Why not child or cat or I don't know, something else that's a little bit less problematic. But there is a very deep reason for the mother and it's the mother archetype. Yeah, it's not your own mother per se, it's the mother archetype. So just unpacking that a little bit, lots of you have had this teaching before. Um, do you remember why it is we use the mother archetype in developing bodhicitta? I know that Eleanor knows. <laughs> she doesn't have to talk if she doesn't want to. Yeah, Pamela, go ahead. It's because the mother archetype is the, the being that uh, takes us from our fragile state and enables us to survive. So whether it's our mother or grandmother, friend or whomever, that's who enables us to blossom, to even yeah. just live. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that, you know, there was a point in our life where we would not have survived without her. Um, because this is a gratitude exercise, you're wanting to go to the most kind of pure and fundamental, clean, clear form of kindness that human beings give each other. Yeah, or that even mammals give each other or other animals give each other. We're wanting to really tap into the purest form of love we've experienced so far. And it, it's of course, I'm sure easier if you are a parent because you know, you know, the kind of selflessness, especially in those, you know, rough mornings and constant crying and the worry about sickness and all that kind of stuff, you know, but I think if we can tap into some sort of time, whether it was with our own mother or some other caregiver where it was so obvious that they put our needs ahead of theirs. Yeah, that we genuinely were coming first because that's incredibly rare in human relationships where you are genuinely put first, right? Maybe your partner does it occasionally, spouse creatures do it occasionally, maybe, but like on a good day, right? Like when they've like been well fed, you know, it's like it's hit and miss, right? Human beings, they do their best, but you know, who puts you first? So it was in those like infant years, particularly where if they had not put you first, you would have died right? So you're really tapping into, those were a lot of sleepless nights for her. She sacrificed her whole body for nine months. That was not comfortable. You know, we romanticize pregnancy and we say, isn't it glorious, but like, it is not fun, right? And even women who have not been pregnant can imagine, I don't think that would be great, actually. I think that would be quite uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so you're just really thinking about like, okay, Whatever our relationship is now, mom, that was really nice of you. Yeah, that was rough. And I was kicking the heck out of you, you know, and I was rolling around and I was giving you indigestion constantly. And then birth, I don't even want to know. That sounds just like a horror movie. And thank you so much for going through that for me. And yikes and sorry and thanks. Sorry. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, how many times in your life did. I guess your, her convenience get put aside for you. You know, there was things that she would have preferred to have done and she just didn't because you needed something. Um, somebody needs to mute themselves, darling friends. Done, okay, well done. Okay, so we're, we're using the mother archetype and you can think about, you know, animals that you've really seen beautiful mother-child dynamics with. You can think about maybe if it was your father instead of your mother, but what you're trying to do is to take some sort of snapshot in your mind of the purest form of kindness so far and then think every single sentient being that has ever existed has been that kind to me at some point every single one of them. And then you think, well, what's the logic behind that? So the logic behind that becomes kind of like tricky Buddhist philosophical territory, but the short version is time is beginningless. The number of sentient beings, while so vast, it's as if infinite, and we even sometimes say numberless sentient beings or infinite sentient beings in prayers, they actually are finite in number. 
there are no new sentient beings being created. So the kind of new age idea of old souls, we don't buy into. We say there are certainly people who have been human more often and who have maybe learned more lessons and so have a kind of a maturity about them, but actually we're all the same age. So time is beginningless, number of sentient beings is finite. Putting those two ideas together, you've bumped into each other many, many, many times. Like we've all bumped into each other many, many, many times. And, you know, and Lama Zopa Rinpoche will say very cute things like, I have eaten you many times, <laughs> you have chased me many times, you know, like, and you can imagine, you know, being a little fly and he's the frog, you know. <laughs> so it's not like it's only the parent-child dynamic that we've been in, but we're not picking that one. We're not thinking all sentient beings have been my en enemy, so I'm going to get a bomb shelter and hunker down. You know, it's equally true. All sentient beings have been our enemy, even your best friend, right? But you're picking the mother time because all sentient beings have been your mother at some point or another and during that time they were incredibly kind to you and when you think about someone else's kindness towards you deeply you have a gratitude bubble up that wants to repay their kindness and it has to be the kind of like unmessy untangled version of wanting to repay their kindness not the like, I owe them, or it's a burden. It's like the, the joyful gratitude of that was amazing kindness that I want to pay forward. Not I, I was given all of these things, so I better make the most of it or else I'm bad. Not that. It's, it's the gratitude of I want to pay that forward. So this is the reasoning in the sevenfold cause and effect for why we see all sentient beings as having been our mothers. Hi, that's me, Christina. Oh, hi, Christina. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Um, what about in the situations where you get uh, the uh, stereotype evil or wicked stepmother, or uh, as we've heard of, we've heard about in recent years, where mothers kill their children? You know that karmic connection. Yeah, that happens, right? That that's part of the big picture. I mean, you know, we've all been terrible tyrants and horrible dictators and benevolent friends and you know the savior of all and tiny dung beetles we've been everything you know in tibetan in buddhism in general samsara or cyclic existence reincarnation is not linear in that you're always progressing up right you go up and then you go down and then you go up and then you go down and it's not tidy right you're not in like this tidy evolutionary process unless you make it intentional, right? So if you make it intentional, you're gonna have forward progress. But if you don't take your mind by the reins, you could just as easily be a dung beetle again, or just as easily be an evil stepmother again. You know, so right now we haven't had conditions to bring that out of us, but, or maybe, <laughs> right? But it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be conditions that would nurture our resentments and our arrogance and our, hard-heartedness that wouldn't turn us into that like are we well trained enough in our love that if things got really rough we wouldn't burn with resentment and take it out on other people we're probably not that well trained yet we're just lucky to be surrounded by good conditions and maybe we are well trained enough but i mean just kind of like sit with that one side but think that's not unique like all sentient beings have been there we've been there that's not the archetype we're looking at even though that archetype exists right? We're looking at the pure form because you're taking that as the example that's going to be the catalyst for gratitude. Yeah. So, so just kind of hunt around in your memory. Was there a time when someone selflessly loved you, even if only for a moment? Do you take that snapshot in your mind as the example of what is possible for sentient beings and think if it's possible for sentient beings, it's come up in every relationship with every sentient being at some point. And Isn't whatever, it all, hmm, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't also possible that that evil stepmother or evil person to you is there for you to have a karmic lesson? Well, this is, this is an interesting side piece, right? Is that whether something is a lesson or not is up to us, <laughs> right? So to think that, you know, they've been given to me as my dear teacher you decide if that's true or not. Yeah. We have karmic debts with everybody, right? We have lessons to learn from anyone. Um, there's not like a, 
I don't know, a committee <laughs> that's like plotting and <laughs> saying like, what is a good lesson for Christina today? Let us bestow them with this difficult character and see what she does with it. You know, there's not a committee. Um, there is the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas who wants us to develop into enlightenment and might do the best with conditions given our karma, but it's our karma in terms of our possibilities. It's not our karma in terms of fate, right? Karma is not fate. It's not punishment. It's not reward. It's not destiny, right? Karma is just natural cause and effect playing out internally and reflected externally to overly simplify it. So certainly people come into our life and you could say they were a much needed lesson for my spiritual growth, but they didn't have to have any intention to be so and no one had to send them. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, it's more empowering to think in those terms than to be constantly waiting for the Buddhas to tell you what to do, send me a lesson. It's like, you got plenty of lessons in front of you, take the ones you're ready for. Do you know what I mean? Did I lose you, Christina? I might've lost her. I don't see her face. No, you didn't lose me. I'm oh, just, I didn't uh, lose I'm just, yes, in a, I'm just packing up. I'm in, on a trip at the moment. Mm. <laughs> fair enough. But yeah, that's, fair that enough. sounds a very interesting way of looking at karma as well. Uh, the, I always, you know, were led to believe karma is you do this good or bad thing and then you get the opportunity to put an antidote either way. Well, it's true that you have the opportunity to do the antidote either way, but it's, I guess there something about the way you're framing it, and this could just be my projection, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. we'll acknowledge that, but something about the way you're framing it seems to imply that there is um, more intention with things coming towards you, mm -hmm. you know, that like things are more intentionally being sent to you than yeah. is actually the case. Yeah. And certainly the Buddhas want to help you. Certainly the Buddhas are sending conditions to support you, but that's not the same thing as them like orchestrating a being to be your teacher in a certain way. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's about really making sure we take the idea of external sentience out of our karmic stuff. Our karma is our own. It's our own mental stuff. We plant a karmic seed. We water it with conditions. We have a karmic experience. It's cause and effect that we made. Mm -hmm. yeah and um, that clears that up thank you yeah yeah no and it's a it's a common thought so I'm glad you brought it up yeah so yep yeah. yeah go ahead Teresa I don't know if this is the right time so feel free to not answer it but yesterday you talked about um so good we're watering the good karma bad karma is also blooming <laughs> and you use the words we let it die a natural death is that yeah and um I've never heard that before so I don't even really know what my question is, except it sounds like maybe don't interact with the negative karma. Well, it's more like don't feed what's happening when negative karma ripens, because then you're going to water another karmic negative karmic seed and you're going to have back to back negative karmic seeds ripening. Uh -huh. You know, and, and the last thing we want is back to back karmic seeds happening, which are all often of a very similar type. And so it feels like you're just having the same thing happen endlessly, right? You keep meeting the same person again and again in different forms. And you're like, oh my God, right? And you think, what is the universe trying to tell me? And the Buddhas are like, your karma is telling you you have a habit, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. And so when you're experiencing a difficulty, mm. if you don't feed it with afflictions, that seed will finish, you know, just like a seed only has a potency to live a certain lifespan, mm -hmm. you know, and so if you don't engage with it negatively, you're not watering other negative karmic seeds, so it'll finish. Mm -hmm. And that very process of forbearance and bringing reframing to a difficult situation waters positive seeds, which will then have an opportunity to give you happiness and resources when that old one finishes its round. Okay, got it. yeah, yeah. so it's, it's this lag time that we're always trying to process. Yeah, the lag time of karma of, I'm thinking about it r the right way. Why don't I feel better? And it's like, well, give it a minute. <laughs> you will give it a minute. The old one's got to finish. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and you're doing really the best you can with it if you can frame it well while you're feeling bad or while things are hard. Yeah, yeah give it a minute. Yeah, it's tricky. You, did you have something, Amy? Um, well, we're talking about 
bad karmic seeds. What if you had planted an entire field? <laughs> Join the club. Join the club. <laughs> How do you not engage with that bombardment? Yeah, you know, uh, she's asking what if you planted a whole field of negative karma? And uh, we all have, just assume that. So um, welcome. <laughs> and um, really, you're, you're doing a twofold approach of trying not to water them so they sprout into experience, which means try not to engage with negative states of mind like anger and attachment and jealousy. Or when they arise, don't feed them. Let them just roll through like waves. So that process of not watering. The other process is preemptive strike, right? So burn the seeds before they can sprout. And that means purification. Yeah, so purification is basically just thinking about the things that you've done that are reflected in that negative karma. Like if people are always criticizing you, think about your habit of criticism and purify that. Yeah, and there's procedures and stuff that you can do for that. So it's kind of this twofold approach of don't water and then burn the field. <laughs> yeah for the negative karma. Yeah. So, um, so this sevenfold cause and effect to develop bodhicitta, you know, once you kind of have this equanimity of all sentient beings, you know, I want to see them all in the same light, even though they're not same people and I don't have the same rapport with them. They all have Buddha nature and they have all been my mother. So then you remembering the kindness of the mother archetype if you can think of memories from your own mother that helps or your father or caregivers or you know whatever or stories you've read or stories you've seen to, to kind of touch that in such a way that gratitude starts to bubble up that wants to repay their kindness which then begs the question how right how do you repay their kindness and loving kindness is wanting them to have happiness so the first way to repay their kindness is wanting them to have happiness which is not orchestrating things you think will make them happy and like forcing it on them and being like a compulsive gift giver or like, you know, something neurotic like that. It's about a mentality. May you be well, may you be happy. Yeah, just may you be well, may you be happy. Which then leads to, and may you be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. So from loving kindness, you move to compassion. And when you sit with the compassion long enough, because it's fed by this gratitude, it bubbles into the highest intention or into great compassion that thinks, I need to be proactive in providing the best conditions for people. And that makes you think, what are the best conditions for people? Well, if I was a Buddha, I would be accurate and specific and know what to do when and I wouldn't be suffering in the meantime and bringing my baggage to their, you know, grief. And that would be really useful. So I need to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it's a logical sequence. And you stay with each point long enough for it to feel true or to have resonance. And when it does, then you move on to the next one. When you do a guided meditation, you have to just go the pace of whoever's leading it. But when you're by yourself, you might just stay with one, you know, and just kind of be like, all sentient beings have been my mother? Wait, all sentient beings? Wait, all? <laughs> you know, and you're walking around and you're like, mom, 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 <laughs> right, you know? And, um, and why mother and not child? Because mother, you elevate and have a sense of respect for. Child, you, have a, you can have a more of a tendency to be slightly patronizing or condescending of like, I'm helping all sentient beings down here. So you want to use the mother or some sort of elevated archetype feeling so that you don't fall into the trap of, I am the mother of all sentient beings, my children, you know, and get like weird like that. You know, we're wanting to keep elevating and keep like really strong respect for sentient beings. Not to say that you don't have respect for your kids, but it's a different type. So just really gently that way. Um, so when you look at that list, do you have any questions before we just do the meditation? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, do you have, sorry. Um, uh, when uh, it comes to kind of lojong, I think it's lojong when you take suffering of others and giving uh, them like light and happiness or to. Uh, when it comes to um, sickness, they, they said that I've heard that um, 
you don't uh, you don't cherish yourself even when you are very sick and you take like this sickness as a sickness of all beings and you take it like with open arms um, is it mm -hmm. is it like goes to which one is it like Rick, uh, I mean, it, goes, it, it goes with the one that we're going to do next. It goes with equalizing and exchanging this one, which oh, we'll do okay. next. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's yeah. coming and up. Is it, uh, sorry, is it uh, like the way that um, you just cut your bad karma that you, you, your seed is like ripening, your bad karma is ripening and doing this, I don't want you like uh, talking to your sickness is it like kind of grow it back to another seed? Well, it's a lot of things are happening simultaneously, right? So karma is extremely hidden phenomena, like more even than the emptiness of inherent existence. So the details of what's happening are a little bit too complicated to get into, except to say resistance very likely leads to agitation and negative states of mind. So you're probably planting more seeds. Mm -hmm. So you can suffer and let it finish or you can suffer and add more seeds of suffering. You got two options, but once the suffering is ripened you kind of have to ride it out. Yeah, so ride it out well, you're planting positive seeds and letting that one finish. Ride it out poorly with afflictions and aggression and agitation and grumpiness and all the things human, understandable, worthy of compassion, but plants more negative karmic seeds. Is it um, that you have the intention that you wish to appear your kindness, or do you have to figure out an actual way to appear? Yeah, it's, it starts with the intention, which then builds into, may they have happiness, may they be free of suffering. So it kind of gets more specific. Mm -hmm. And then it boils down to the best way to repay their kindness is if I become a Buddha. So it's not like the best way to repay their kindness to go pay their house. Exactly, exactly. You're like, if I've got time as part of my practice of becoming a Buddha to paint their house, I shall. But that's not the way in which I'm repaying their kindness. You know, it could be painting the house as part of the practice that you're, you know, in the momentum that you're creating. But it's, it's very much about don't get lost in the minutia, you know, and really keep holding open the big picture of the goal is enlightenment whenever it happens. What are the things that I can do to bring the intention for enlightenment even to the simplest of activities? And what bodhicitta is an antidote for is self-cherishing, which is the negative self-obsession that looks after yourself at the expense of others or with indifference to others. So if you're thinking about enlightenment all the time and how to be of benefit to all sentient beings, then when you're doing ordinary things like, I don't know, making your breakfast, you know, say you're in the kitchen making your breakfast and other people are coming and you just naturally hand them the milk. <laughs> you, you know, you notice if you're in the way of the line, you know, it's increasing self-awareness, not self-consciousness. You're not like self-conscious, like, oh no, oh my God, I'm so sorry, here's the milk. It's not like that. It's like, I am in the way <laughs> here. <laughs> right you know it's a lot more in the flow state yeah and so then the little details kind of get taken care of uh, really naturally so you don't have to live this whole extreme different you know ascetic life of, of you know a monastic or something and not that mine is particularly renounced but you know you don't have to go nuts with it it's about having a strong intention makes all the ordinary things into a spiritual practice yeah, and then you don't get obsessed with the ordinary things as being the only thing you can do to help, you know, and that you have no sense of fulfillment unless you're helping in some way, you know, because that's an easy trap we can all fall into is I'm not good unless I'm helping. It's like your biggest helping is to develop your spiritual path. If you got time, paint the house. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's do a meditation and then we'll have a little stretch and a short break and then do our last meditation. So get yourself a, a posture that feels stable and uh, add a cushion or subtract a cushion if you need to. And any wiggles that you need to get out, get out the wiggles now. But you also have permission to wiggle throughout. So don't worry. Okay. A few deep breaths.
and then bring your focus down to your stomach, to your diaphragm, where the air makes the stomach rise and fall. And see if you can focus your breath at that lower point. Just kind of find that place, even if it's a very subtle movement. And it's a good way to notice whether you're just breathing in the chest and just inviting your breath to go more fully. And as you stabilize your awareness of the breath, just simplify it to one point, just one small area while you're focused the breath on and keep bringing your attention back to it. And as thoughts arise, just notice them without push or pull, without chasing them, without suppressing them. Just notice that they exist, but they are not your main interest. Your main interest is awareness of the breath. Use it as an anchor to keep you present and focused. And you can allow your mind to touch any distractions, inner or outer, notice them and bring yourself back. And now consciously shift to analysis. 
And just start with a reflection that even though my relationships are very varied, all sentient beings are the same in just wanting to be happy, not wanting to suffer. It's only the expressions of that that are different. But just kind of let your mind touch that truth. Just want to be happy, not to suffer. And then shift to exploring the idea that every single sentient being has been your mother. That time is beginningless. We agree there has been a big bang, but maybe many big bangs. Even quantum physicists are beginning to accept that might be the case. Beginningless time. But because all sentient beings are a finite number and the time has been so vast, we've bumped into each other and had relationships of a million different types in a million ways, millions of years. But we centralize on the fact that we have been mothers to each other in the sense of caring and selfless altruism, patience, so much patience. Those people in your life right now who have been problematic and difficult, at one time held you in their arms when you were so vulnerable and tiny. Those political figures or historical figures that you cannot comprehend their degree of evil weren't always like that, won't always be like that. have even fed you from their own bodies. And so shift into thinking about the kindness of mothers, your own mother or mothers you've seen just consciously remember the kindness. And see if that memory of kindness felt or observed can turn into some kind of authentic gratitude. That all of the amazing qualities you have right now, all of your resilience, so many things came about because of having been taught and having been supported in crucial formative years 
in this and in past lives. So see if that kind of gratitude can turn into wanting to pay it forward, wanting to repay the kindness. And so what do they want? They want happiness. And so wish them happiness, all of your mothers from beginning this time. All of the mothers in your life right now, whether currently friend, enemy, or stranger, may you be well. May you be happy. And we wish to repay their kindness by wanting them freedom from suffering. All the mothers, may they be free of suffering that is mental, that is physical, situational, whatever. All forms of grief and stress, may they be free from this. And so see if you can let that turn into a sense of wanting to facilitate that. Wanting to be the strongest possible positive condition to alleviate suffering for all your kind mothers. To transition from wanting them to have certain things to actually deciding you're going to be a part of that. And so you land on the idea that the best and most expansive and precise way to be of benefit to sentient beings is if you yourself were enlightened. If you were a Buddha, you would understand their karma, what they had space to hear, what they didn't have space to hear. You yourself would not be distressed by anything that you saw. And so just experiment with what it feels like to land on that conclusion. That the best way to repay the kindness of my mothers is to develop my own mind's potential fully all the way to enlightenment. How does that land?
and then we dedicate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Okay, so we'll have um, just a, a five minute break, um, a little stretch, and then we'll do um, the final meditation. See you in five minutes. <laughs> 